My name is Louis Shackleford. I am new to the Seattle community. I work for the Legacy Project under Hank in, in uh, Brad Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And my work in Legacy deals with doing diversity and inclusion work in HIV research. And so that's a part of why I'm here and why I'm helping to host this event, which I think is great. And so we have a person who's very esteemed in HIV research here, uh, Mr. Greg Millett, who's here to talk to us more about his work and HIV policy in general. So first of all, I'd like to say, give a hand to yourselves from showing up. <laughs> And I'd like to thank Northwest Pride of Color and Tristan for having this event and hosting just Northwest Pride of Color in, in, in general. So I just want to give it up to Tristan one time. <laughs> so at this point, we have our speaker, Mr. Greg Millett. Woo! You're going to let him sit down. Yay! I'm going to be comfy and sit. <laughs> I had no idea that you guys were recording, but I know that my husband is going to look at this and he's going to say, what the hell were you wearing? <laughs> so feel free to come around. Feel free. Uh, we elicited some questions from the room beforehand. So well, I have those questions right now. We'll get to a chance to get to as many of them as possible. But uh, so I guess since we have you here, we better just jump right into it. Let's do it. So, Mr. Greg Millett, you are Vice President and Director of Public Policy at the Foundation of AIDS Research, correct? That's correct. Right. And so, tell us a little bit more about the Center of AIDS, the Foundation, sorry, the Foundation for AIDS Research okay. and your work with us. Sure. So, while I'm looking around the room and I'm just trying to see how many people are close to my age, and there's maybe a couple of us. So maybe there's like maybe uh, about 10 of us here who probably knew who Elizabeth Taylor was. Mm -hmm. um, and Elizabeth Taylor was, uh, you know, of course, an incredible starlet in Hollywood and everything else. Um, during the AIDS crisis in the 80s, a lot of her friends were uh, dying from HIV and AIDS. There were not a lot of prominent people who were celebrities who were speaking up about it because the stigma uh, about being HIV positive or having HIV was so great. Um, and Elizabeth, as well as a scientist named Dr. Matilda Prim, um, two heterosexual white women, um, took it upon themselves to help destigmatize HIV and to educate the American public about it. Um, and that's how AMFAR was created. And now, if you Google AMFAR, um, what you'll probably see are lots of pictures of Miley Cyrus looking great, or Justin Bieber, or Heidi Klum, or anything else. And, some of the ways that we get our money, or actually the main ways that we get our money, um, is having these lavish events in South of France, in Brazil, in China, and other places. Um, but the wonderful thing about those events is that people are actually getting money for us to do the work that we do. So I'm, in, I'm the head of the public policy office, which is the office in DC. Um, we're mainly uh, involved with doing a lot of lobbying work with the White House, a lot of lobbying work with uh, Congress and others. Um, there's another office in Bangkok that does primarily research, um, NIH-sponsored research, clinical trials, cohort studies, etc., um, mainly on people who are uh, living with HIV as well as people who are, have HIV and HCV. And then the New York office is all about the celebrities, all about the models, all about the bling and everything else. Um, I remember the first week that I started working at AMFAR, um, I ran into two people who were there. The first was, do you guys remember Tyson, the model? Mm -hmm. um, ran into Tyson, and I just about died. I, you know, I told, told my husband, I, you know, I love you, but <laughs> Tyson. Um, and so he was uh, one of the people I met there. And then the other person you know, was just rounding the corner, and there's Heidi Klum looking glamorous. And you're like, wow, this is kind of wild. Um, so the New York office really deals with a lot of the celebrities and everybody else. Um, as you can imagine, um, being in Washington, D.C. has been so much challenging um, recently. There's a lot of different things that are taking place um, that's making it tougher to fund both domestic as well as global HIV policy. Um, there's a lot of positions that are not yet in place in this administration, either in um, uh, the State Department or even in the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, we 
no longer have an Office of National Aids Policy in the White House. So the office that I was in when I was there, um, there's absolutely no one who's staffing it. Um, and we're having a big debate right now in the advocacy community where some people are saying, well, perhaps it's bad that we don't have an Office of National Aids Policy because our concerns are not rising to the top. Uh, whereas other people are thinking, well, maybe we need to go through a period of benign neglect because we know that if this administration has their eyes or their hands in anything, that is probably not going to be a good thing. Um, and it might be better for us to just not have an office right now. So that's one of the main things that we're dealing with right now in DC. Okay. And so one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is your work actually in the Office of National Aid Policy. Uh, you were there and you joined the Obama administration from 2009 to 2011, and you were a senior policy uh, writer, correct? And so, can you talk a little bit more about the national aid strategy and doing policy in the White House? Yeah, so um, I'm an epidemiologist by training, an infectious disease epidemiologist by training. Um, I never thought I was going to be a researcher. That all kind of happened by happenstance. I thought I was going to either become an attorney doing civil rights law, um, or I was going to get a PhD in history. But Berkeley didn't accept me for history, so mm -hmm. that went there. Um, and then I took a small stint doing a law in New York City and absolutely hated it. Uh, so I was just working with as a paralegal and thought, okay, this is definitely not for me. Um, at the same time, there were a lot of friends who were getting sick um, and dying of HIV. This is in the 80s when I graduated from, from school. And I decided to go into public health in the 90s, so that's what I did. So I was a scientist with CDC for 10 years and uh, really happy being at CDC, really happy living in Atlanta. And I got this email soon after President Obama was elected that was from a friend of mine in Washington, D.C., someone I went to college with. Um, she's also very big into the HIV field. And she said, hey, would you ever consider moving to Washington, D.C.? And I said, no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, come on, I had my house, I had my friends, my partner and I, you know, loved being in Atlanta. I, I wasn't even thinking about it. And then she said, it's for Obama in the White House. And I was like, oh, hmm, let me get back to you. So um, I went ahead and I spent a weekend trying to pull together my resume and trying to you know, do all these different things. And it was weird because I've been with CDC at that time for 10 years. And I love CDC, so I never updated my resume. So imagine spending a whole weekend trying to update 10 years worth of your life into a resume. It, it, it wasn't great. Um, and I kept telling my partner, look, I'm not going to get this. I'm a scientist. There are all these people who do policy work. I don't know the first thing about policy, so this is not going to happen. So about a month later, I, you know, I sent in my resume. A month later, I went to Washington, D.C., and I spoke on a panel um, about HIV and HIV disparities, the same topic I'm going to be speaking about tomorrow. And on the panel was Obama's person, who is the head of the Office of National Aid Policy. So he got to check me out and hear me speak. And he was like, hey, I think I remember that your resume came in. I was like, yeah. He's like, let me call you up tomorrow. I want to do an interview. It's like, OK, fine, no problem. He calls me up the next day, and I'm, of course, all in my head like, oh my god, this is the White House, this is the White House, this is crazy. I stammered through the whole interview. It was an epically bad interview. It was the worst interview of my life. Um, he was asking me all these questions about policy. I kid you not, I got on Google and I typed policy. What is this? <laughs> because, you know, as a, you're a scientist, I know clinical trials, I, I know how to do sample size calculations, I know how to publish in medical journals. I did not know what policy was, and particularly what health policy was. So I thought I stammered through the whole interview and was just giving nonsensical answers. And right after it was done, he's like, okay, you know, I'll give you a call in a couple of days and I'll let you know um, what the disposition is, because I've got to interview all these other people. Um, so my partner called me and he's like, so how did it go? And I was like, oh, it, it stinks. We're staying in Atlanta. Don't worry about it. It's fine. You know, I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get this anyway. Two days later, um, I get a call and it's the White House and I got the job. So that was a, a complete surprise. And they said, we want you to start within two weeks. Uh, so I had to pack up 10 years of my life in Atlanta find somebody to rent my house, move all my stuff, and get there within two weeks. 
And uh, the first thing that we were set up to do is because the president pledged, along with candidate McCain, during the campaign to come up with the nation's first national HIV AIDS strategy. The first thing that we had to do was start thinking about, okay, so how do we start planning this? So I was working with Jeff Crowley as his deputy in the Office of National AIDS Policy, and the first thing that we did was to try and come up with some community forums on getting community input for the national HIV AIDS strategy. So from there, everything just kind of took off to writing the strategy and everything else. But then there are also great things to be a part of in the White House, like um, at the time there was some craziness that was happening and unfortunately is still happening in Uganda and gay bisexual men. Um, where GLBT populations are being persecuted. So, you know, within my first week of being there, I got pulled into a meeting in the Situation Room, uh, which is just kind of crazy to talk about Uganda and what we're going to do about the homophobia in Uganda. Um, the third week I was there, we were talking about um, the policy that the United States had against allowing people who are living with HIV from emigrating into the country or staying within the country, which kept the HIV AIDS, International HIV AIDS Conference, from coming to the US for 20 years. Um, and then we talked about, OK, well, how are we going to systematically dismantle this policy? And what are the things that we need to do with that? Um, and then um, maybe well, I wasn't there for more than three months, and we were talking about, OK, well, what are we going to do about syringe exchange programs and making sure that we can get federal funding for syringe exchange programs? So it almost felt like a dream being there, because you're doing all of this work that's meaningful. You're doing this work. Um, trying to remove policies that have been bad policy and that have been on the books ever since, you know, Jesse Helms and others were in Congress in the 1980s. And you're with a White House with a president who firmly believes in science and believes that policy should be predicated on science. So it was amazing to start acting on all these things that I learned during CDC and even during graduate school as what I know are proper interventions. And then seeing that actually being written into a policy and moving forward. Um, at a national level, it's just incredibly fulfilling. And can you talk a little bit more in depth about overturning those bad policies? Like you mentioned, the ban on individuals who are positive coming into this country and getting uh, IAS to be hosted here in the United States. Can you talk about more specifically how that whole process worked of overcoming those bad policies? Sure. So a lot of that is lawyers, 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 and more lawyers. So mm -hmm. I, we met with so many different groups of lawyers in the White House to try and figure out how you overturn this policy, um, what are some of the specific steps that you need to take. There's a part of the White House called OIRA um, that deals with all the regulations uh, that the government has. And we met with that team of lawyers for the better part of a year to try and figure out how do we go ahead and change this policy. The first thing that you need to do is you need to publish something in the Federal Register. Um, which says, hey, we want to make a change in the policy. This gets published, and you have the American public actually comment on it, saying whether or not they think it's a good or a bad idea. Um, and of course, um, we got maybe half and half. Some people who say, why do you want to change this policy? Why do you want to have all these people um, who have this life-threatening illness coming into our country? Um, and, and of course, it's not based upon an informed decision because we already have such a high prevalence of HIV here that, in fact, many people are coming from countries where the prevalence is actually lower um, than the US. So uh, you, you had that. But then you also had some Americans um, who really understood the situation and felt that this was something that needed to be changed and you know wrote to us about that as well. After that, um, we got to work with OIRA and others about, OK, well, how do we change this? What are some of the specific um, regulations that we need to work with? This is when we worked a lot with Secretary Sebelius, who used to be the head of Health and Human Services, and her team and others, to try and figure out how we craft this policy. And then working with the lawyers um, in the Department of Health and Human Services to come up uh, with the right policies. And then from there, it just gets formalized through executive um, decision. Um, and you know, we were able to get a change and to actually bring back the conference um, after a 20-year absence. And I have to admit, that was I've been to several international AIDS conferences. That was perhaps the most joyous, was to actually have the conference back in the United States. To be honest, though, it was also one of the most stressful conferences mm -hmm. because it was back in the United States, which was great, but it was back in the United States in 2012. And in July of 2012, just months before another presidential election, and I was the government lead 